subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello, welcome to your favorite integrated science class on Joy Learning. I'm your teacher, George Loco from St. Mary's. We know that in our daily activities, we are supposed to eat balanced diet. And one definition that we are giving for a balanced diet is simply food containing the various nutrients in their right proportions. One of the nutrients that we need in a substantial amount is what we call proteins. So for us to get proteins, we can get them from plants or from animal sources. That we can have primary or secondary proteins. This means that as humans, we will have to find a way of getting proteins from other animals by killing them. And for us to get these proteins, then what we have to do is to either go hunting, and nowadays it's difficult to get the animals from the bush, or to raise the animals so that we can eat them, we can kill them and eat, or use their parts for other uh, purposes. In view of that, today we want to look at how we can raise animals or livestock for our benefits. And today we'll be looking at a concept in Form 2 called General Principles of Farm Animal Production. General Principles of Farm Animal Production. To help us learn today, let us look at our learning objectives. So we are doing general principles of farm animal production. And by going through the ob objectives for the day, I want to say that by the end of today's lesson, you, my favorite student, uh, will be able to outline the main activities involved in the production of farm animals. You should be able to outline the main activities involved in the production of farm animals. And then secondly, you have to describe ruminant production. And if time permits, you should be able to explain some husbandry practices. So we'll be looking at a general outline, description of ruminant production, and then husbandry practices. So we said at the beginning that for us to get these proteins in our diet and other parts of animals for our personal use, we should raise these animals. And we know that there are so many animals around us, but not all of them are intentionally raised around us or by us for our own reason. The ones that we have domesticated and we raise them are for our personal use are what we call livestock. We call them livestock. So we can say that livestock are simply animals or domesticated animals raised in agricultural settings to provide labor, produce other commodities such as meat, eggs, and milk. So you see, apart from getting protein from them, they can also give us energy or work for us. So we can get labor, and then we can also get eggs, and we can also get milk from them. Usually, the livestock that we keep around us can be largely classified into two. So we have animals that we raise around us, but if we look at the animals around us, we can largely divide them into two. Animals that we call ruminants, and then others we call non-ruminants. So we have ruminants and non-ruminants. So the livestock kept are largely classified into ruminants and non-ruminants. So let us look at some examples of ruminants. Then we shall try to define ruminants. We know that from the basic level, that is the JHS level, we were told that ruminants are animals with four chambers stomachs, and they can also chew their cud. So let's look at some examples of ruminants. And we, when we look at animals that can chew their cud, the first one that comes in mind is the cattle or the cow. So we have the cattle, we have the goats, a lot of goats around us, so we see them. Sheep as well. Some people raise animals like the deer or the antelopes as well as giraffe. So you see a deer or an antelope or probably a giraffe normally in a zoo setting, all right? But we can use their parts for other purposes. And examples of non-ruminants are the pigs, rabbits, poultry, 
horses, fishes, snails. So here, a pig is not a ruminant. A fish is not a ruminant. So a horse is not a ruminant. And a rabbit, poultry, they are all not ruminants because they don't have four chambers to max, and they also do not chew their card. So displayed on our screen, displayed on your screen, are some of the pictures of these ruminants. So let's look at some ruminants so that you can easily keep it in your head. So we said a sheep, a goat, and if we are to move to our next slide, a bull, a bull, which is a type, it's a male cattle, male cow, all right? We call it, a, a, we call them bulls. We have different types, and as we move on, we shall mention some of their names. But this one looks very attractive, right? So we still have antelopes. Some people raise antelopes, all right, in their own setting. And others also do same for giraffes. These are nice animals. Apart from they giving you meat or serving as labor or giving you milk or other uh, commodities that you want from the animal, they can also serve as what? A tourist site. So you can still make money from them. So you can have a giraffe or an antelope. Now, some of the non-ruminants we mentioned uh, were poultry. So we can have ducks, guinea fowls. The normal fowls we have at home, what we call the gallus domesticus, and the rest. So we have on our screen a picture of a duck, a picture of a guinea fowl, and they are all happy. We use them for their feathers. We go for their feathers. We use their meat, all right? And in some cases, like that of the ostrich, we even use the skin for leather. So we have a turkey. And then a fowl, a fowl. These animals help us during ceremonies and celebrations because we kill them to give us a source of meat. They serve as a source of meat and they help with our protein requirements. So we are still looking at a grass cutter. A grass cutter. All right, they are a nice sight to behold when you see them feeding. So we can use their meat, we can also use the fair or the skin. And on the right hand side of your screen, we have a rabbit. A rabbit. A rabbit. It's a very beautiful rabbit. And we can use their skin or the fur for other things. Another non ruminant that we mentioned earlier was a pig. A pig. All right, so this is a pig, a nice picture of a pig. We can get meat from it as well as the skin. A horse, a horse. I'm sure most of us, if not everybody, have seen a horse before, whether in reality or on TV. So we have a horse. On the screen, we have a catfish, a catfish. We mentioned fishes. We have different types of fishes, but a catfish is one of the fishes that we often eat. And it is important that we take a look at it because it is also a non-ruminant. Tilapia. A tilapia, which is another fish and is very common on the market. Snail. A snail. All right, so snails also serve as a source of protein. And they also have important minerals required by our bodies to function well. Their shells are also rich in calcium carbonate. So sometimes their shells are equally guarded, bent, and they are used to mix with the feed of animals to supply them with calcium. And they can also be used in the making of paint. So all these animals that we raise around us, we say can largely be classified as livestock. And livestock can be divided into two ruminants and non-ruminants. So we have the ruminants and the non-ruminants. So we want to look at the importance of farm animal rearing. Why do we raise animals around us? Why should we raise animals around us? So we are going to look at some of the reasons why we raise them, and the rest I'll give it to you as homework to read around, and we can communicate 
from the feather. So rearing animals have a wide significance, some of which are they serve as a source of food by providing essential food nutrients. So like I started, we said that um, nutrients requires that uh, our nutrient uh, requirement demands that we must have protein. And one of the, min the, the, nut the nutrients we get from animals is what we call protein. So rearing animals or livestock around us helps us to get that part of our food requirement by killing them and then we cook and we eat them. So they serve as a source of food by providing our essential food nutrients. Now they also serve as a source of income when sold. So as an SHS student who has some small backyard, you can raise some of these animals and growing them and bringing them uh, sometimes brings you joy. You have that happiness when you see them. But in addition to all the things you get from them, at the end of the rearing, you can sell them and get some money. So here, you can sell the animal and then you get what you call income or sometimes foreign exchange. Some of the animals are said that we sell them to people outside and you can get a foreign currency and it brings you a lot of local currency. So here, it is good for you to raise animals and apart from you getting the pleasure of bringing them up, you also become rich when you sell them. So it is good for you to start, if you have not started, start raising animals around you. And at the end of it, you can sell them. Some people raise dogs and they sell some cats. So whatever small thing you can do, you can also raise an animal and sell them. If the place is small, you can look at snails or rabbits or grass cutters. They are fun to be with. So they also serve as a source of power and transportation. Some animals or livestock are raised so that they will give us what we call power to plow the farm. For example, bullocks or cows all right, or donkeys are used on farms to plow or till the land. And in this case, you don't have to use a lot of energy to plow the land because the animals are stronger than you and they can easily help you by plowing the land. So you have to fix the right equipment to their body and they will help you do it. Apart from this, in some remote parts of the country, and even in this part of our world, we use them as a source of transport. So here, you don't need to sit in the car. If you have a horse, you have a donkey, and sometimes, depending on whether the, the bullock is well raised, you can sit on it and it will carry you around. You also be happy, and they also enjoy having that interaction with us. So they serve as a source of power and transportation. Now, they also provide clothes, and other products such as wool and hide. Do you wonder where the clothing you are wearing comes from? Sometimes we get these nice fabrics, apart from the synthetic ones, we get them from natural sources and they are very expensive. And some of these uh, natural things we get from the animals are what we call the wool. And we also have the hide, the skin, that we use for leather, for all kinds of shoes and bags and other things that we we fancy, all right? So we get clothing and other products such as the wool that they use in making the winter jackets, all right? We insulate our bodies against cold and also hide what we also use for the leather, all right? So they are also used for sports and pleasure. Sometimes you watch TV or you watch games and you see horses racing, all right? Dogs racing. We have all kinds of animals and sports, all right? So it is a nice and sometimes a wonder, all right, to, to be home. When you see them, you are excited, all right? You are very excited. So they are used for sports and pleasure. And they are also used for research and medicine. Most of their drugs, if not all, were raised in laboratories and they were first tested on animals. If these animals were not there, it means that we will not have a conclusive report on them. So they are used in the area of research as well as medicine. So in the lab, they have mice, all right? They have all kinds of animals. They test these um, uh, chemicals that are being generated for our benefit, all right? And other humanity, as well as even the other animal kingdom. Well, their dunks provide us with manure. So if you are raising, for example, grass cutters or rabbits at home, and you feed them with the grass, 
They are excrement is what we call manure. So you can use the manure to fertilize the land around you and you can plant food, all right? So here, the animal is giving you manure in addition to even the skin, the hide, and the meat, as well as the income that you will get. So it is good to enter into the area of a Greek and start something small. Sometimes it's difficult, but when you start and you see that uh, there's joy in it and you feel fulfilled, all right, and in addition to all these, you make money. And you know money, we all like money. All right, so start something. I want to see you starting. And then one of these days, you invite me to your farm. I'll be happy to look at the things you have. So they are used for research and medicine, and they provide manure, manure, which can be used to fertilize the land. All right, we can use to fertilize the land. So now we are going to look at some of the livestock, some of the animals we raise, and the major products we get from them, animals around us, and what we get from them. All right. For example, you will not raise a grass cutter, okay, and then you want to get an egg from it because grass cutters only eggs. So the animal you raise will determine what you will get, or what you will get will determine what you want to raise as a livestock around you. So let's look at some of the animals showing on your screen. All right. We have a two-column table. One on the left is a farm animal. And the one on the right is the product. So we have what we call the farm animal. All right, the farm animal. So we have animal here. Animal. And then the product or products. So let's look at it. We shall start with cattle. That is a cow or the bull. All right. And cows are raised for their meat. The meat of a cow is called beef. So we get beef from them. In addition to that, we get milk from them, all right? Milk is an essential material that we all take from these animals. And particularly those of you in SHS2, you know that milk is so important when it comes to that food which we call our first aid, Gary Soakings. So here we add milk to it. In addition to that, milk also is served during um, our breakfast so that we can add it to other food source, uh, sources. So here we have the beef. We can also get the hide, that is the skin of the cow. All right. Apart from we getting the skin that we can use for leather, um, myself, I like it, even though there's nothing in it. We call it willy in our normal or local language. All right. So with wachi, you can get a nice cow hide. And then you enjoy it with your wachi, very wachi, hot wachi, with hot pepper. So we have your meat, you have your milk, you have your hide, and farm manure. Cattle gives you large quantities of manure because they have large appetite for green plants. So they give you lots of manure and you can use it to fertilize large tracts of land and produce more food for yourself. So it means animals are helping you to get manure and you also get meat from them. You are not going to make more money from plants. All right. So farming is a very, very nice thing. Apart from it uh, giving you money, you also get that fulfillment. All right. I tell people that there's more joy when you plant something or you raise an animal and you harvest it and you, you feel very happy that you're able to raise the animal or you're able to plant that uh, tree or whatever and you're enjoying its fruits. So we have the hide, the farm manure, and then we can also get energy or work from them. The bullocks are used for plowing, all right? Um, so if you go to farms where you have to weed these days, we are moving into mechanized farming. And we use animals, but now we are using machines, all right? Machines are making things very easy for us. So let's look at sheep. Sheep. Now, for the sheep, we have different types of sheep and what they are used for. But ultimately, we get meat from them. The meat of a sheep is what we call the mutton. So we have the mutton. And then we can also get wool, all right? The skin or the fur, all right, can be used in... Uh, in wool, we get wool from them, and we can use that one to make our clothing, all right, to insulate our bodies against the cold. Now, we can also get the hide, that is the skin, as well as uh, the hair, and then you can have milk and manure. So you see that manure has come again. They are herbivores, all right, and they are ruminants. They eat grass. So apart from they eating the grass and man, uh, manicuring the, the grass around us, uh, you also get nutrients from them. It can use to re-fertilize the land for more plants to grow for you. So we have the manure, and then we can also have the goats. 
goats, goat meat, so nice, right? Goats. Now goat also gives us meat, the chivon, and then we can also get the hide as well as the milk, and we can get manure also from goats. So you see, even the first three we have mentioned, apart from the meat, the skin, the hide, the fur, and other things, you get manure, all right, manure. Okay, so you can get milk from cattle, you can get milk also from sheep, and can also get milk from goats. There are certain goats they raise for milk. They are very, very rich in, uh, when it comes to producing milk. Now, let us look at pigs. Pigs. Some people call it brachas. Pigs. Mm -hmm. We get meat from pigs, what we call pork, and then meat products. All right. You can have your sausage, and then you can have your smoke ham and the rest. Okay. So, depending on what you want to use the meat for, you can use for all kinds of things. People like pig, uh, the, the, the pork, and it's very nice you know, with fried yam when it's very hot. So, you can have the bristles for brushes, all right, the affair is very short, very, very hard, so it's easy for making brushes, so that you can use it to brush your hair. But I also have the synthetic brushes, so take note of them. And then you can also have their skin used for leather, and also manure again, all right, so when you raise them, you can get manure. Let us look at rabbits. Rabbits, um, we get meat as well as the skin for clothes and decorative purposes, as well as manure, and for poultry, we are looking at the fowls. We get meat, we get eggs, we also get feathers for stuffing pillows and poultry manure. So if you raise animals, you always get manure as a byproduct. And you can use to fertilize the land around you and plant other um, crops, all right? So it is good to raise animals around you. And you will be very happy you actually raise them, okay? So now let's look at, now we know the livestock. We know what a ruminant is, what a non-ruminant is. We've mentioned something about them. We cited examples of ruminants. We've also cited examples of non-ruminants. Now we went on to also look at products we can get from the ruminants as well as the non-ruminants. We want to move further into looking at the main activities involved in farm animal production. All this while we've been telling ourselves we should raise an animal, we should raise an animal. So what goes into raising the animal? That is what we want to look at. The main activities involved in farm animal production. So the main activities involved in farm animal production are, so we are going to enumerate them. The first one is selection of a suitable breed or breeds. Mm -hmm. You want to raise an animal. Which animal do you want to raise? Okay, I want to raise a cow or no, I want to raise a goat or I need a rabbit, all right, or probably a snail. Which breed are you going to select out of the snails? Which ones do you want to raise? All right, so selection of suitable breeds. And then the second one is the choice of management system. How are you going to manage, are you going to allow the animal to go out, feel free, and when it's tired, it comes back, or it will just be going around, and when you're tired, you catch it somewhere around the market and kill it there. Or you keep it somewhere in your house, take good care of it, and make sure that the animal is healthy. All right, so we are going to look at the choice of management systems. Then the third one, the breeding systems and care for the young. Now they started um, mating and they started reproducing the young ones. How do you care for them? All right, you want to raise dogs at home and you have settled on which dog you want to raise. Which system are you going to use? Are you going to keep the dogs at home? Now you've, you've decided that you keep the dogs at home. Now they started breeding, they started multiplying. How do you take care of the young ones? We are going to look at all these. And then the fourth one is management practices, including animal health care and feeding. Management practices, including animal health care and feeding. And the last one here is finishing. Now you've done all the selection, you've taken care of them, you've given them medicine. How do you do your finishing? How do you get your products from what you are raising? So finishing, processing, and marketing of produce. Yes, you want to make money or you want to get an income from the animal. You have finished raising it. Now you have to go and look for market. You have to beg somebody to buy the thing for you. How do you search, how do you search for those people and how do you come across them? So that you can make the income that you've been thinking or dreaming about. So we shall start with the first one, selection of suitable breeds. Selection of suitable breeds. So we shall start by looking at what is a breed. Okay, so I mentioned breed or breeds. 
all right, breed or breed. So let's look at the definition of a breed. So we say that a breed of animal refers to a family or a class of particular animals that have similar appearance, a family or a class of particular animals that have similar appearance and can pass the characteristics onto their young generation. All right, it's a family or a class of animals that have a particular appearance and they can pass that characteristics onto the next generation. So you have identified a particular grass cutter. It's so huge. You want to keep that type of grass cutter. Okay, so you want to make sure that the way it looks, the young ones will also look like that. So we call that grass, that type, a breed. But that means that for a particular set, for grass cutters, you can have different types and you have different characteristics or features. And that is what we call a breed. So a breed of animal refers to a family or class of particular animals that have similar appearance and can pass the characteristics onto their young generations, onto their young generations. So some animals grow better in a given flock than others under the same similar housing conditions. So you want to look at, okay, you have selected, you want to select a breed that has a certain characteristics. For example, it grows faster, grows huge, all right? You want to look at all those before you select them. So you will now list the, the qualities that you want, then you go and look for that type of the breed that will give you those qualities. All right. So you want animals that can grow quickly so that they can easily mature and you can sell and make money. So some animals grow better in a given flock than others. All right. Under the same similar housing condition. You will see this when it comes to raising of goats and sheep. You have some two or more sheep, maybe from different people. And when you when they are put together and you watch them grow and they are multiplying. You'll be surprised to see that others grow faster and the others look stunted. Not that they don't want to grow, but it's the gene that is limiting them. All right, so we've had what you call proliferation of recessive alleles or genes. So that is what causes that. So you want to avoid those things, and hence you go for a breed that will give you a superior quality. All right, a superior quality. So farmers with the proper record keeping can select the best breed with, within the flock for breeding. Um, so here you you keep records, okay? You have come across animals with this type of character. That is what you want. And you want to raise that type of uh, animal. So you have to keep the record before you can make references to the features or the characteristics. Then you can go and get a new one to join what you have and you start breeding them. Sometimes good performing breeds from other farms are brought and mixed with the flock to improve the breed. So maybe you're already in breeding. You are, you, have a, you are a young boy, you are a young lady, you have some goats and you are bringing them up or you are, you are rearing them. But you realize that the output is not that good. So you can go to your friend's farm or another person who owns goats or sheep. They have the same or higher or superior characteristics or qualities than what you have. So you go and bring one or two out of that and then you buy them actually. You buy them and then you come in and then you add it to what you have. So as they, as they breed or they copulate, they infuse their characteristics, and they see us also flourishing. So we do that when it comes to selection of the breed. And we do that so that we can have an improvement in the performance of the animal in terms of the product. So you want to have what you call an improvement, maybe in terms of the meat quality, or in terms of the carcass, the size of the meat, or the eggs that is producing, or the quantity of milk you want to get for, from them. So you go for these characteristics, and then by record keeping, you can go and then look for these animals to improve your yield, and you make more money, all right? The income goes up. So if you don't do this, then you have what you call inbreeding. So you have animals from the same small nuclear family, they keep multiplying. So here, the same male is uh, mating with the mother, the, the daughters, all right? So you have what you call proliferation of alleles, recessive genes. Okay, so maybe in the gene line, you have a certain gene that is determining small size. So instead of the animal growing bigger, now they will become smaller and smaller. So it means you have to bring another gene from another person to multiply with what you have. And then you can have an improvement on the farm or the product. So inbreeding among breeds must be avoided, all right, to prevent recessive allele proliferation, which results in inbreeding depression. So the animals become smaller, you don't get the yield you want from them. They, they are more or less depressed. And you also be depressed because you are feeding them, but you are not getting the required outcome or the required characteristics from them. This is characterized by weak offsprings and poor growth rates 
and birth deformities. So if you keep breeding the same set of animals, same mother, or right, the same line, you have what you call inbreeding, and that results in deformity. So some of the animals will be born with diseases or congenital diseases, and you have to deal with it because it is expensive to manage those animals. They are, they are naturally sick. We're taking them to the vet all the time. Vet will also have to come to farm and be administering drugs as well as injections. And that means you are losing a lot of money. But since you don't want that, you want animals that will be superior or they will be resistant to diseases, then you have to take your time and select the breed so that when you start the farming, you will not lose out on the farming. So you want to avoid slow growth rates as well as birth deformities. Okay, so after the selection of the breed, we want to look at the choice of management. How are you going to manage the animals you have selected? You are bringing them home. How are you going to manage them? Are you going to allow the animals to go around and look for their own food? Some people get um, go for some animals, and then they leave the animals, and the animals are fending for themselves. A goat that they brought from a farm with a lot of grains that was eaten, now it's in Accra, there is no grain, it's running from people's homes and eating from rubbish bins and other things. All right, so in that case, the animal will not even grow well. It's always sick, and it's full of diseases. So if you go and kill that animal and even eat, chances are that you'll get even other disease if the meat is not even well cooked. All right, so we want to look at the choice of management. How do you manage those animals? There are three main animal production management systems, all right? And like I mentioned earlier, these are what we call the extensive. So we have the extensive, and then we have the semi-intensive, and then we have the intensive. Extensive, then we have the semi-intensive, and then we also have the intensive system. The type of system selected by a farmer depends on the type of animal, purpose of production, and availability of facility. So you see, you want to raise an animal. You selected the animal or the livestock you want to raise in your home or wherever or whichever place you want to raise them or on a farm. The type of animal that you will select will depend on the facility you have. Maybe you want, it is your wish that you keep the animal in an enclosed place and take good care of it, but you don't have that money. You don't have that facility. So it means you cannot run total intensive system, all right, where the animal is kept in a well or a, a well kept area and they are very clean. Okay, so sometimes you allow them to run what you call the semi intensive. You provide the shelter, the animal comes to roost or to sleep, and then that is when the weather too is not good, they can hide there, they are protected. But when the weather is clear, they can go out and eat and come back. Right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's not a good thing. But um, if you leave your animal, it is not proper, they will go to people's homes and they can be killed, car can knock them. All right, and you'll not be happy when you see them in that bad or poor state. So the animal that you choose, all right, will, 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 be, de will be dependent on the facilities that you have and what you want to make out of it. So if you want to raise fowls for eggs and you just allow the fowl to be roaming around, it will lay eggs anywhere and you'll not get the eggs. All right, so it will de uh, the breed will determine the type of management system or the choice of management system that you will be using to bring the animals up. So you should note that every management system has its own advantages and disadvantages. So I just mentioned that with the extensive animals are allowed to go freely and they fend for themselves. When you are ready to kill them, you go and look for them, and then you kill them. Sometimes you will not get them because people too will steal them. All right. So it has its own disadvantages and advantages. All right. Uh, with advantage, you say that oh, you will not feed the animal. The animal is taking care of itself. So uh, when it's time for you to kill, then you start going from home to home, looking for your, your fowl or your goats, all right, <laughs> to go and slaughter. So it, they, 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 the choice of management system they will all have their uh, advantages and disadvantages. So let's look at some of the uh, management systems. So we'll start with the extensive system, all right, the extensive uh, farming system. So with this, animals are allowed to go out. They eat, sometimes they don't come back, they keep going. But because you think you have a fair idea of how they look like, by the time maybe you want to harvest it, they've grown bigger than what you saw, so you lose and then you can't get them. You, you forget the, the nature, you can't get them again. But in some cases, so people take them out for a very long walk. So maybe you have what you call the animals that graze. Okay? Our, some people are nomads, so they carry their cattle or their cows, um, or their sheep and goats 
from one place to the other. So maybe from the southern part, they are traveling all the way north. So by the time they get to the northern part of Ghana, they actually walk and they eat, they eat the grasses and the vegetation as they move. And sometimes they become a nuisance. So I mean, let's say that you are a farmer, you have planted corn, and these cattle or sheep are moving in your territory. They will eat your corn. By the time you come, you have labored to get something from the plant and they have also come to destroy. So they have their own disadvantages, all right? And they bring misunderstanding between communities sometimes and people, or, or between people. So with the extensive system, you can have a nomad. An example is what you have on your screen, a nomad walking the sheep from one place to the other. When it's raining, there is no shelter. They are beaten by the rain, all right? And sometimes if there are trees, they hide under the trees. Okay, so we look at the semi the semi-intensive system, the semi-intensive system, all right, the semi-intensive sy system, or the semi-intensive farming system. With this type of system, the animal is given shelter or is provided with a place to rest, and then it can also go out and feed and come back. So it is partially protected and is partially fending for itself. Sometimes they are even given food outside, it's just that they are allowed to go out and then exercise. So those animals are more stronger. All right, and the intensive one. The extensive are very, very strong, but they are also susceptible to bad weather and they can be destroyed by the weather as well. So we have the semi-intensive, where you have uh, points or places of abode for the uh, animals and they can come and roost. For these, on your, the ones on your screen, you will see um, fowls, all right, pecking at plants around, but they have various um, shelters provided for them. In the evening, they all go, and then the, the, the owners will come and lock, all right? The owners will come and lock them. So, so we can also have the intensive, where there's a well-structured well -structured, uh, system where animals are kept internally. They don't go out, okay? They are given quality food, so they grow well, and you can get maximum yield from them. The only problem is that they also don't exercise. All right, so you have a, a cow or a sheep that has not been exercised, so it's, it's obolo, obolo kind of um, um, animal. So you can kill it, and then you get more meat also from it. So a picture is what is displayed on your screen. So let's look at breeding systems and care for the young. Breeding systems and care for the young. Well, you've selected the animals. You've, you've also gone for the choice of a management system how do you breed the animals and how do you care for the young? So breeding is the careful selection and pairing of animal or pairing of living things in order to produce offsprings with improved qualities, all right? So you, you select the animal, then you put them together, male, female, so that you can produce offsprings with improved qualities. There are three types of mating. So here, you are putting them together so that they can mate and produce young ones, which you are interested in their characteristics from them. And when you put them together, they will mate. So the question is, what type of mating are you interested in? Are they going to mate naturally, or you are going to use artificial means? So there are three types of mating chosen by farmers at a time. And these are pasture mating. So pasture mating is where the animals are allowed to mate on their own in the field, uncontrolled. They mate at the time they feel like, all right? When one is on heat, then the, then the male will mount. All right, or you can do hand mating. All right, hand mating. We'll talk about the types of mating. Or you can also do artificial insemination. All right, artificial insemination. They all have the advantages, and is what you want to get from it uh, will determine what you do. So you can have the pasture mating, hand mating, or the artificial insemination. Now, pasture mating is uncontrolled mating within a flock or a head. Uncontrolled mating within a flock or a head. And hand mating is the placement of an individual oestrus female in small pen to be mated by a male under supervision. So here, um, with a pasture mating, the animals, let's say you have goats, so you have male goats and female goats, they are moving together. When a female comes on uh, heat, the male mounts uncontrolled. You don't take part, you, don't, you, you, you are not part of, you can't even monitor sometimes. But in the case of the hand mating, the female that is on heat is isolated and kept in a small enclosed area, and the male is actually added so that you can monitor the mating, the, what you call the crossing, so that you can maximize crossing and get better um, young ones from them. And 
it goes to supervision. But in the case of the partial mating, um, it's, it's highly unsupervised or uncontrolled, all right? Uh, so that's what we do. Now, in the case of the artificial insemination, all right, that is a high-tech system. Artificial insemination is the process of collecting sperm cells. So you collect sperm cells from a male animal and manually deposit them into the reproductive tract of the female. So here, the male is somewhere, the female too is somewhere. You don't actually need the two of them to come and meet. All right, you can artificially collect the sperm cells from the male. There's a way they do it. There's a technique, all right? And then the sperm cells are treated, and they go and inseminate it into the uh, female, all right, for fertilization. And you get a very high yield when it comes to artificial insemination. Okay, so, and they do that by, by inserting or depositing the sperm cells through a duct into the reproductive tract of the female. Right, so let's look at the, the type of mating depends on the type of animals being bred. So here, you cannot do artificial insemination with fowls, all right? So here, you have a, a, a cock somewhere, and then a female somewhere. You can go and then harvest. It can be done in a lab, all right? But you as a person, you cannot be harvesting the sperm cells and then fertilizing that of the female. But in a lab, it can be done. Mm -hmm. So we move on to management practice, all right, including animal health care and feeding. You've selected them, you've chosen the management system. You also selected the technique you use in mating, all right, and how you bring up the young ones. Now, how are you going to manage the animal health and feeding? The animal must be healthy so that you have it grow and give you the meat or the product that you want from it. Then you can use it for whatever you want to use it for and get your income. So let's look at the management practice, including animal health care and feeding. The success of a management practice in animal breeding is important to the farmer. So you want your, the, the management system you are using to be successful. And that is why you are taking time to go through all these steps. Well, so the decision that affects effective farm animal output depends on proper farm record keeping. So that means that before you can take a very effective decision, you must be keeping records, all right? Whatever you see, um, you, do, can, you can do daily records or per, per four hours or two hours or some animals, they monitor them hourly, all right, if you want to maximize um, the output. So the proper record keeping should inform the farmer on decisions to take in order to maximize profit and reduce costs, all right, of production. For example, reducing feed wastage and stealing on the farm. So when you do proper record keeping, it gives you an idea of what is happening on the farm. And that can help you reduce a lot of costs. So if the animals are falling, so you can easily see, then you can intervene. Give them the nursing medication they want. They become healthy again, and they are growing so that you will benefit at the end of the whole process. And when you do proper record keeping, you also know the amount of feed you should give them. You shouldn't just go and pour the feed down and you walk away. When you do that, you are wasting feed. Some of them will eat, others they will just walk and then poop inside and they will not do anything. So you've lost a lot of um, uh, money in terms of feeding, okay? And in addition to that, because you are not doing proper record keeping, when they steal it, you will not even know. So you have to do proper record keeping and that will help you to manage your farm very, very well. So records also help the farmer to detect early animal health issues, like I said, an appropriate solution to prevent farm loss. So you are, in an, you are in an enclosure, you are taking care of animals, and all of a sudden you hear of swine flu in the area, you have to quickly start monitoring your animals so that uh, you don't lose them, all right? So that you don't, and then you, you apply the proper uh, management system so that they also don't get the disease, and then you also not uh, lose them. But should they get it? Because you are keeping records, you will know how to go about things. You will take proper decisions, all right, to bring them up to speed. Whether you have to kill them or you have to keep them, that will be determined by the vet. Well, so this involves the farmer going through routine husbandry practices, for example, deworming. So some animals, you have to deworm your animals frequently, all right? There are times of the year or in the course of the production that you need to deworm them. All right, and some you have to castrate, okay? Some of them you have to castrate, and normally you keep some, those which are healthy to do the mating for you, and the ones that you are not interested in, you castrate them, so that they will not have certain odor, and they also grow bigger for you to harvest. 
Now you can do docking, all right? Docking, you dock their ears, all right? And then you can do dipping, dipping. And then the feeding strategies you can also use to improve breed performance. So, so that I know that some animals you need to feed them at this point or this quantity of feed is what they need. You don't just pour it. And this comes by looking at all the record keeping and applying effective uh, decisions, all right, to improve upon the yield. Now you have done all these. How do you finish your farming process? So let's look at finishing, processing, and marketing of produce. Finishing, processing, and marketing of produce. So depending on the farm product, the farm animal could be sold at a tender age or when mature. Some animals are sold when they are young, others are sold when they are matured, all right, depending on what the market is looking for. And then slaughtering and packaging of meat must be well done, all right? The price of the product must be competitive. So when you finish killing them, you do, when you kill them or slaughter them, you have to do the packaging under a hygienic environment, all right, so that you can also attract good markets and then you will now get the income that you want. So even when you are slaughtering them, it must be done under a very, very clean environment so that you can attract proper markets. And this could be achieved by having an idea of market price. So here, you want to sell the animal. Before you can sell them, you must know how much they are selling for at the market. All right, so if you are happy with what they are selling for at the market, then you can sell them either by slaughtering them or by giving them out alive for people to go and uh, slaughter by and then they slaughter them. So the farmer can also add value to the farm products in order to increase profit. Sometimes you have, let's say, um, um, you have, let's say, a fowl, you are raising a fowl, and you want to maximize the outcome from whatever you are doing. So you can get the manure, you can get the feathers so that you can to, uh, to stuff um, uh, pillows, you can get the meat, all right? So you add value, whatever you, you want to, you want to process it to the last bit so that you can get more revenue from the products, okay? You can add value. Now let us look at ruminant production, ruminant production. Ruminant. We said they are animals with four chambers to mark, and they chew their card, right? So if they have four chambers to mark, they chew their card. We've seen examples of ruminants already as the livestock we mentioned earlier, but it's also worth mentioning. So you can have the cattle, the sheep, the goats, the deer, and the giraffe. And there are so many of them. The pictures are still rolling on your screen. So these are all ruminants, all right? They are ruminants. Now let, let's look at the management practice in ruminant production. Now when it comes to breeding, this is the mating of carefully selected and female livestock in order to produce young ones for food or income. So the breeding is the mating, all right? So take note of that. And in livestock farming, breeding is controlled, all right? You have to control the, the breeding. Now why should you do that? Reasons for controlling breeding in livestock. Why should you control the, the breeding? Now one, it allows a female time to recover from each bed. When an animal gives birth, it needs time to recover. It's, it, it becomes weak, so it needs time to recover from the child bed. You don't have to allow the animal to reproduce, and then because it has come and in heat again, then it's crossed. No, you have to allow the animal to recover. Then that can give you a healthy, all right, or um, an offspring with a more desired character. So it allows a female time to recover from each bed, and it allows males to recover from each crossing, and this prevents overuse. So if you keep crossing, using a male to cross and cross and cross, the animal now become overused or spent. It cannot give you the sperm cells or healthy sperm cells that you want. So you need to allow it also to recover. It also helps the farmer to select breeds with the desired characteristics for breeding. Now, let us look at the desirable livestock characteristics for breeding. What are the desirable livestock characteristics for the ruminants for breeding? So one, the Animals should be resistant to disease and pests, okay? You want to raise animals that will not easily fall sick. They are resistant, so they will not be spending money. And then, adaptability to changing environmental conditions. Some animals cannot stand slight change in the environment. When the temperature becomes very cold, they die. Or when the temperature becomes very hot, or the weather becomes very hot, they can also die. So adaptability to changing environment. And then you can also have early maturation or fast growth rate. That is what you want, so you can get to the meat and feed efficiency. They're able to convert the feed to meat. Mm -hmm. When they eat, they eat, they're able to give you maximum output from the little feed that they take, all right, in terms of muscle and 
So we also get high milk yield, all right, high milk yield. And then we can also have high milk, high meat yield, and then better quality carcass and productivity of animals, productivity of animals. So we look at types of breeding or mating, types of breeding or mating, depending on the type of um, farm management that you are using. So we said you can have different types of um, mating or breeding. We said you can have the pasture mating, and then you can also have the hand mating, you can also have the artificial insemination. So let's look at them briefly, and we'll see what we can get from it. So pasture mating, or what we call um, yeah, pasture mating or pasture breeding, um, is a random mating of livestock or livestock in the field. In this method of breeding, the males move with the females, and mating occurs when the female is on heat. This breeding is not controlled. So here, the male crosses the female when the female is on heat, and you don't have total control over it. You cannot even monitor when the animal comes on heat and it's called cross. So the problem associated with this pasture breeding is that the male may ignore young females. So we have, you have young females and the young, uh, older females coming on heat at the same time. The, the male will ignore the young ones and go for the older, older females for crossing them. The time for the younger ones will pass. Maybe you want them also to reproduce for the, the number to go up, all right? And it results in undesirable offspring. So you are going to have same, same gene being reproduced and you will lose the quality with time. And that brings what you call the depression, if you remember. However, it is less labor intensive. You, hear, you don't take part in anything. The animals just, they themselves reproduce and you are interested in, oh, it has given birth, the number has gone up, you are happy, then you shout. But sometimes you don't get what you want from them. So this is a typical picture of pasture breeding. They are going, they are eating, and then the male mounts the female because the female is on heat. And for the artificial insemination, the spermatozoa or the sperm cells from the male are artificially inserted into the female reproductive tract using gadgets, all right? And that means that you will need somebody who is trained. If you are not trained, you can't perform that. And that could, because if you are not trained and you try doing the animal could get infections and the animal can also die. So you will need training for this. So this is the careful deposition of collected spermatozoa from a proven farm animal male into the uterus or vagina of the female counterpart on heat using human devices, or uh, using human, uh, humane devices or without using natural mating. All right, so you have to use machines. So a picture of it is shown here. There's a cattle that is on heat, and they are artificially inseminated. So they use gadgets. Right? They, they study the, the nature of the vulva and the color and the, uh, the secretions before uh, they do this artificial insemination. So you need proper training to do this. Now, they also have the advantages, all right, and some disadvantages. Let's look at them briefly. Now, it prevents venereal diseases. There is less wastage of semen. It produces healthy offsprings. It improves the general stock rapidly, and it enables the farmer to select desired traits. All right? So the advantages are quite many. You get so many things. Now, others are coming. Semen can be cold stored. You can store the semen. So even if the male dies, you can still have the semen and use it for other females in the next generation. So semen can be cold stored for years and also be transported everywhere you can. So sometimes people buy semen from all parts of the world to improve upon their use. And conception rate is increased since there is certainty of depositing semen behind the cervix at a proper time. Well, there are some disadvantages also. So let's look at it briefly. Now, farmers may not be trained and hence have to experience, have no experience to detect when female animals are on heat. So if you are not trained, you will not know when it's on heat. All right, it requires more time and strict supervision of animals and storage of semen may be affected by unfavorable conditions. So if you don't have the favorable condition, the semen will be destroyed. All right? It is difficult to restrain farm animals. And there are inadequate facilities. Sometimes you may not have the facilities to carry out the process. The time taken to travel from one artificial insemination center to scattered farms is often too long. So you have gotten for the, yeah, you've gone for the semen and you want to transfer it to your farm. The distance may be too too long. By the time you get it, the semen will be destroyed because you couldn't even store it under the proper uh, facility or conditioning. In summary, what we have done today is to introduce ourselves to farm animal production, general principles um, on farm animal production. And what we said today is that farm animals are animals raised on farms for their meat, dairy products, eggs, or bring the farmer income. 
and we cited examples of farm animals as fowls, ruminants, non-ruminants, and the rest. And the main activities involved in farm animal production, we said you should have selection of suitable breeds, choice of management system, all right, feeding and health care. Then we also went on, we ended it with um, how to get the animal products on the, on the market. So these are the few things we have done so soon. Our time is about, let's finish ra uh, uh, wrapping up. Breeding systems and care for the young, management practices including animal health care and finishing process and marketing produce. So that is what we have discussed today. So I cannot sign out without giving you an assignment. So your assignment for today is for you to define the following. Please read more and then uh, ask more questions, answer more questions. You can also share it with us. All these videos will be on the social media. You can have it on uh, my Joy Online, um, YouTube, all right? It's on YouTube especially. And um, you can have it on other uh, Joy Learning um, social, handle, uh, social, uh, social media handles. You can, you can get to this one. Define the following farm animals, ruminants, artificial insemination. So soon our time is up. I am George Loco, your integrated science facilitator from St. Mary's Senior High, Kolebu. Thank you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.